Chapters One and Two of When Shadows Die, a sequel to Love's Bitterest Cup. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bridget Gage. When Shadows Die, a sequel to Love's Bitterest Cup by E. D. E. N. Southworth. Chapter One Meeting and Parting. The Earl of Enderby and his sister, Mrs. Force, acting under the directions of the Earl's doctor, now set out for Germany, and in due time reached Baden-Baden. Their apartments, which had been secured by telegram, were ready for them. They had one night's rest from the journey, and were waiting for their breakfast to be served in their private parlor, when they were surprised by the entrance of Mr. Force and all his party. The family had been separated scarcely three months. Yet to see them meet, a spectator might think they had been parted for three years. They soon paired off. Mr. Force and his wife sat down together on a corner sofa, and began to exchange confidences. Leonidas and Odalite stood together at the window of the room, looking out upon the busy scene on the street, or rather seeming to do so, for they were really talking earnestly together on the subject of their troubled present and uncertain future. They had not been separated for one day during their travels, but they were to say good-bye to each other very soon. It might be for years, and it might be forever. And so they seized every opportunity for a tata -ta tat Wynnette and Elva hovered around their mother, in their delight at seeing her again. The invalid earl sat for a while alone and forgotten, until little Rosemary Hedge, who was also overlooked in the family reunion, drew a hassock to the side of his easy-chair, sat down and laid her little curly black head on his knee. The action was full of pathos and confiding tenderness. The earl laid his hand on the little head and ran his thin white fingers through the black curls, but neither spoke or needed to speak, so well the man and the child understood each other. "'Leonidas, my boy,' called Abel Forrest from his corner, "'I wish you would go and see if we can get rooms for us all here. This should have been seen to sooner.' "'You need not stir, young sir,' said the earl, and, turning to his brother-in-law, he added, "'Your apartments are secured, Force. As soon as I received your telegram, saying that you would join me here, I sent off a dispatch to secure them for you. I hardly need to remind you that you are all my guests while we are together. But you travelled by the night express. You must have done so to reach this place so early in the day, so you will want to go to your rooms. After you have refreshed yourself, join me here at breakfast.' Leah rose at the earl's request, and pulled at the bell-knob with the vigor lent by his impatience at being called from the side of his beloved, and which soon brought a servant to the room. "'Show these ladies and gentlemen to the apartments prepared for them,' said the earl. The man, with many bows, preceded the party from the room, and conducted them to a large family suit of rooms on the third floor, overlooking the new promenade. The travellers remained some weeks at Baden-Baden. The baths were doing the earl much good. Mr. Force also needed their healing powers. Some were on his travels with the young people, not having his wife to look after him. He had contracted rheumatism. He could not exactly tell when, or where, or how, whether from exposure or rain and mist on the mountains, or from fishing on the lakes, or from sleeping in damp sheets, and drinking the sour wine of the country, or from all these causes put together. He could not say, so gradually and insidiously had the malady crept upon him, taking its chronic and least curable form. He had not mentioned one word of this in any of his letters, nor had he spoken of it on his arrival. Indeed, as he afterward explained, never having had any experience to guide me, I did not recognize the malady at first, but merely took the feeling of heaviness in all my frame for over-fatigue, and even when that heaviness, being increased, became a general aching, I still thought it to be the effect of excessive fatigue. I was slow to learn, and slower to confess that I had the special malady of age, rheumatism. However, I thank heaven it is not acute. It has never laid me up for a day, he added, laughing at his misfortune. Indeed, his troubles seldom kept him from making up parties for excursions to the various objects of interest in the town and its environs. Only when the days were both cold and wet, as is sometimes, not often the case in early autumn there, did Abel Force allow his young folks to go forth alone under the care of their mother and the escort of Leonidas, while he stayed within doors and played chess with the invalid earl? In this way the brothers-in-law became better acquainted and more attached. 
"'I wish you were an Englishman, Force,' said the Earl one day, when he had just checkmated Abel, and was resting on his laurels. "'Why? Not because I do not admire and respect your nationality, but simply for one reason. What is that?' I will tell you. You know, of course, that your wife is my heiress, and if she survive me, will be my successor. Now, if you were an Englishman, you might get the reversion of your wife's title. I do not want it. I would not ask for it, nor even accept it. That is your Republican pride. Perhaps you are right. The old earldom has fallen to the distaff at length, and it will be likely to stay there for some generations to come. For Alfreda, who will be a countess in her own right, has only daughters, which is a pity. And yet I don't know. I don't know. If those fellows at Exeter Hall and elsewhere get their way, in another century from this there will not be an emperor or a king, to say nothing of a little earl, to be found above ground on the surface of this fourth planet of the solar system, commonly called the earth, and their bones will be as great a curiosity as those of the behemoth or the megatherium. Shall we have another game? And they played another, and yet another game, in perfect silence, interrupted only by the monosyllable ejaculations of technicalities connected with their play. The earl arose the winner. He often, not always, did. And so he was in high spirits to welcome the return of the excursionists to dinner. Another sad day of separation was drawing near. Lee was to leave them on the 11th of October, giving himself twenty days in which to travel from Baden-Baden in Germany to Washington in the United States. This was according to his uncle's advice. You might stay here until the 15th, or even until the 17th, and then reach Washington by the 31st, but it would, under the most favorable circumstances, be so close a shave as to be perilous to risk. An officer, nay, a man, may risk anything else in the world, Lee, but he must not risk his honor. You must report for duty at headquarters, punctually, on the 1st of November, at any cost of pain to yourself or to others." "'I know it, uncle. I know it, and I will do my duty. Never doubt me.' "'I never do, my boy. And listen, Lee, if you are prompt, as you are sure to be, you may be able to obtain orders for the Mediterranean. And then, Lee, we shall see you again on this side. We will go to any port where your ship may be.' "'Thank you, uncle. I shall try for orders to the Mediterranean, and I think I shall get them. You see, I have been to the west coast of Africa, and I have been to the Pacific coast.' and I really think I may be favored now with orders to the Mediterranean. However, an officer must do his duty and obey, wherever he may be sent, if it were to Bering Straits, concluded Lee, with a dreary attempt at laughter. When the day of parting drew very near, and the depressed spirits of the lovers were evident to all who observed them, Mr. Force suddenly proposed that he and his Odalite should accompany Lee to the steamer and see him off. This proposition was received by the two young people with grateful joy, as a short but most welcome reprieve from speedy death, or what seemed the same thing to them, speedy separation. It gave them two or three more days of precious life, or its equivalent, each other's society. They cheered up under it and looked more hopefully to the future, and in a few weeks more they decided they should be sure to see Lee again at some of the ports of the Mediterranean. When the day of parting came, Mr. Force, Leonidas, and Odalite took leave of the Earl and the ladies of their party, and left Baden-Baden for Ostend. There were not so many steamship lines or such facilities for rapid transit as in these days. Our three travelers went by rail to Ostend, thence by steamer to London, where they rested for one night, and thence by rail to Liverpool, which they reached just twelve hours before the sailing of the Africa for New York. Mr. Force and Odalite took leave of Lee on the deck of the steamer, and left it only among the very last that crossed the gangplank to the steam tender a moment before the farewell gun was fired and the Africa steamed out to sea. A crowd of people stood on the deck of the steamer, waving last farewells to another crowd on the deck of the tender, who waved back in response, and gazed until all distinct forms faded away in the distance. Among those on the tender, who stood and gazed and waved the longest, were Mr. Force and Odalite, who saw, or thought they saw, Lee's figure long after everybody else had given up the attempt to distinguish their own departing friends, in a mingled and fading view. CHAPTER Two, STARTLING NEWS When the tender reached the dock, Mr. Force touched his daughter's arm and whispered, "'We can get a train back to London, and catch the night steamer to Ostend, and be with your mother by tomorrow evening. Shall we do so?' 
or shall we go down to Chester and take a little tour through the Welsh mountains? Oh, no, Papa dear, we will go home to Mamma, if you please, said Odalite, who amid all her grief noticed the pale and worn look on the patient face that told of his silent suffering. Very well, my dear, I only thought it would divert you, he replied. They drove from the docks to the Adelphi, where Mr. Force paid their hotel bill, took up the little luggage, and with his daughter drove on to the railway station, and caught the express train to London, a tidal train that connected with the Ostend night boat. They reached Ostend the next day, and before night arrived at Baden-Baden, where they were received with gladness by their family, who did all that was possible to cheer the spirits of Odalite and raise her hopes for the future. They all remained in Germany until the first of November, and then set out to spend the winter on the banks of the Mediterranean. Their first halting place was Genoa, where they awaited letters from Lee. The letters arrived at length, bringing good news. Lee was assigned to the man-of-war, Eagle, bound for the Mediterranean, bound direct for Genoa. Then, in perfect content, they settled down for the winter. The Earl's health was certainly improving in the mild air of sunny Italy, and his spirits were rallying in the society of his relatives, so he also decided to remain in Genoa. Before the end of November, the Eagle was in port, and midshipman force hastened to see his friends at their house on the Strada Balbi. He had been absent only seven weeks, yet they received him with as much joy as though they had not seen him for seven years. As long as his ship lay at anchor in the harbor, his friends remained in the Strada Balbi, and whenever he could get a day or a half day off, he came to them. When the Eagle sailed for Nice, the family left Genoa for the same city, and took up their quarters at the Hotel de la Paix, and the same pleasant intercourse was resumed, and so the winter passed, and Mr. Force was beginning to contemplate the possibility of having his daughter freed from a merely nominal and most unfortunate marriage. To do this it would be necessary, according to his ideas of honor, that they should return to the state and the parish where the marriage ceremony had been nearly performed, but was finally interrupted. But there was no hurry, he thought. Lee was on the Mediterranean, and his duty would keep him there for two or three years longer. There was another source of occasional uneasiness, the political condition of the United States. Ever since the presidential election, in November, dissatisfaction had spread in certain sections of the country, and trouble seemed to be brewing. All this, coming through the newspapers to the knowledge of the absentees, gave them disturbance, but really not much, so thoroughly confident were they all in the safety of the Union and the grand destiny of the Republic. The clouds on the political horizon would vanish, and all would be well. No harm could come to the country, which was the Lord's city of refuge for the oppressed of all the world. They had not heard a word from or of Angus Anglesia since the Washington detective had traced him to Canada, and there lost him. Lee privately and most earnestly hoped that the villain had got himself sent to some state prison for life, or, well, hanged, which the midshipman thought would have been even better. At least, however, the family he had wronged so deeply seemed now to be well rid of him. But Lee expressed a strong wish that his uncle would return to Maryland in the spring, and have Odalite entirely freed by the law from the bond, or rather the shadow of the bond, that lay so heavily on her life and on his. No doubt I could easily have Odalite set free from her nominal marriage with a villain, who was forced to leave her at the altar before the benediction had been given. But to do this, Lee, I should have to take her home to Maryland, where you could not follow her for two or three years. So what good could come of hurry? Besides, we are no longer molested by the villain Anglesia. Be thankful for that blessing, Lee, and for the rest, be patient. Patient! exclaimed the youth. You have so often told me to be patient, and I have so long been patient, that I am unutterably impatient of the very word patient. I beg your pardon, Lee. I will not persecute you with the word any longer, gravely replied the elder man. Uncle, I beg your pardon. I do indeed. I feel myself to be an ungrateful and most unreasonable wretch. Here you have made my burden as light as you can, by showing me all sorts of favors, and giving me all sorts of privileges, moving about from place to place to give me opportunity of being with you all, and here am I like a beast losing my temper with you. Uncle, I don't deserve that you should pardon me. Say no more, Lee. Dear boy, I can understand your trials, but look on the brighter side, my lad. The best of the business now is that Anglesia does not trouble us. He seems to have died out of our lives. Yes, but has he, Uncle? He did that once before for three years, and even advertised himself as dead and buried. 
but he suddenly came to life again, and sprang into our midst like a very demon, to do us all the harm that he possibly could. How do we know when he will reappear to disturb us? Uncle, I do not mean to threaten, because I do not wish to sin. But I foresee that, if Anglesia ever comes in my way again, the sight of the man will goad me to crime. Oh, no, Lee, no, my dear boy, do not talk so. If ever you should be tempted, pray to the Lord, and think of Odalite. To bring yourself to evil would break her heart, Lee. I will pray that I may never set eyes on that man again, uncle. Soon after this conversation, near the last of February, the family went to Rome to witness the grand, grotesque pageantry of the carnival. Lee could not leave his ship to go with them, and so they only remained during the week of orgies, and as soon as it was over returned to Naples, where the eagle was then at anchor. Here they settled themselves in furnished lodgings, on the Strada di Toledo, for the spring months. It was early in May. They were all, with the exception of Lee, who was on duty on his ship, assembled in a handsome front room overlooking the Strada. The earl, whose health was so much improved that his friends hoped for its full restoration, sat in his easy chair beside a little stand, playing a game of chess with Wynnette, who had developed into a champion chess player, and was much harder to beat than ever her father had been. Mr. Force, who, suffering from a return of his malady, lay on a sofa, pale and patient, but in too much pain to read or to talk. Odalite sat near him, silently working on the silk flower embroidery she had learned to like from her mother's example. Elva and Rosemary, at a round table, were turning over a set of views left by Lee on his previous visit. Mrs. Force was opening a newspaper, received that morning, and smoothing it out, preparatory to reading it aloud to her family. Suddenly she dropped the paper, covered her face with her hands, and fell back in her chair, wailing forth the words, Oh, my lord, my lord, this is the very hardest thing to bear of all that went before. End of chapter 2《ハッピーエンドオブ・ウィンシャドウズ・ダイ》by E. D. E. N. Southworth。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage。Chapter Three。The News。Who that endured them shall ever forget the emotions of that spirit-trying time, when breathless in the mart the couriers met, early and late, at evening and at prime, when the loud cannon or the merry chime hailed news on news as field was lost or won. When hope, long doubtful, soared at length sublime, and weary eyes awoke as day begun, saw peace's broad banner rise to meet the rising sun. Scott. The first gun of our civil war was fired, and its report was heard throughout the civilized world. Oh, Abel, oh, Abel, moaned Mrs. Force, still pale with emotion. What is it, my dear? Calm yourself. All that you hold nearest and dearest are in this room with you. What trouble can come upon you? inquired her husband, rising from his couch of pain and limping toward her. She lifted the newspaper from the floor and handed it to him. Lord Enderby looked from one to the other in perplexity. He did not like to ask a question. He waited to hear. Odalite, Wynnette, and Elva also waited in anxious suspense for their father to explain. Not so Rosemary. Her agony of anxiety burst forth at length in a cry. Oh, Mr. Force, is my mother dead, or what? No one is dead, my child, and no special evil has come to you, said Abel Force. Then, speaking to his expectant friends, he said, There is a civil war at home. His explanation was like a bombshell dropped in their midst. All shrank away, aghast and in silence. Before any one recovered speech, the door was thrown open, and Lee burst in the room in great excitement. You have heard the news, he cried. And that was his only greeting. Yes, we have heard the news, gravely replied Mr. Force. I have come to bid you good bye. The mail that brought the news brought dispatches from the Navy Department ordering our ship home. We sail with the next tide. That will be in an hour. Good bye, good bye, he said, beside himself with mingled emotions, as he hurried from one to another, taking each in his arms for a last embrace. But Lee, this is awfully sudden, exclaimed Mr. Force. As he wrung the young midshipman's hand. Yes, yes, awfully sudden. Odalite, oh, Odalite, he cried, turning to his eldest cousin, and once betrothed last of all, as if he had reserved his very last embrace and kiss for his best beloved. 
oh, my Odalite, may God love and bless and guard you. Good-bye, good-bye, my dearest dear. And Lee pressed her to his heart, and turned and dashed out of the room. But Lee, but Lee, wait! Can we not go to the ship and see you off? cried Wynnette, hurrying after him, and overtaking him at the street door. No, no, impossible, my dear. A boat is waiting to take me to the ship. I have barely time to reach her deck before she sails. There would be no time for last to use there. God bless you. Take care of Odalite. The street door banged behind Lee, and he was gone. Wynnette had flown downstairs, but she crawled up again, dragging weary steps, woe befreighted behind her. She entered the room and sat down in silent sympathy beside Odalite, who lay back in her chair, too stunned by the shock of all that had happened to weep or to moan, or even to realize the situation. Mrs. Force went and sat on the other side of her stricken daughter, took her hand, and said, "'My dear, nothing but prayer can help you now. You must pray, Odalite.' The girl pressed her mother's hand, but made no reply. Mr. Force and Lord Enderby were in close conversation on the political conflict out of which the war had arisen. Elva and Rosemary were standing together in the oriel window overlooking the street, too much startled by the suddenness of events to feel like talking. "'Let us hope that this trouble will soon be over,' said the Earl. "'What, be put down like one of your corn-riots by the simple reading of the act?' inquired Abel Force grimly. "'No, Enderby, I know my countrymen, north and south, and the civilized world will see a war that has never been paralleled in the history of nations.' And his words proved prophetic. After this day every mail from America was looked for in the keenest anxiety, and every mail brought the most startling and exciting news. Every schoolboy and schoolgirl is now familiar with the leading events of the war, and they need not be rehearsed here. Among news of more general interest came some of a private nature to the forces. Among the rest, letters from Mrs. Anglesia, who wrote, "'You had better pack right up and come right home. The devil is to pay and no pitch hot. The people have riz up agin one another like mad. Ned Grandier has gone into the Confederate Army. Sam sticks at home. He says war is bad for the crops, and somebody must plow and sow. William Elk has gone into the Union Army. Thanks be to goodness, old Beaver and old Barnes and old Cop are all past sixty, and too old to fight, or they'd turn fools with the rest. But as it is, they're obliged to stay home and tend to their business, and take care of Mondrier and Greenbushes. But they do say, hereabouts, as old Captain Grandier, and he over seventy years old, has turned pirate or privateer, or something of the sort, and is making war on all Uncle Sam's ships, but I can't believe it for one. And young Roland Bayard is with him, first mate, and is as deep in the mud as the captain is in the mire, and is tarred with the same brush, which I mean to say as they are both a-pirating on the high seas, or a-privateering, or whatever their deviltry is together. So they say hereabouts." Anyway, the ship is overdue for months, and neither ship, officers, nor crew has been heard of with any sort of certain sureness. And what I said in the beginning, old woman, I say in the end, as you and the old man had better pack right up and come right home. But still, if it would ill convenience you at the present time to do so, you needn't come, nor likewise fret about your home. To be sure, the devil is let loose all over the country, but he hasn't entered into Mondrier or Greenbushes yet. Me and the three old men, Cop and Beaver and Barnes, and the old niggers, take the very best care of everything. You bet your pile on that, so do just as you think proper. This letter filled the forces with dismay, as it told them that their old friends and neighbors had risen, so to speak, in arms against each other. But the most disturbing part of the news was that which referred to old Captain Grandier and his mate, young Roland Bayard. Mr. Force, from his boyhood up to middle age, and Mrs. Force, from her first arrival in Maryland to the present time, had known the old mariner intimately, and respected him highly. They knew him, even in his seventieth year, to be strong, vigorous, fiery, and energetic. But with all their knowledge of him, they could not know, in his absence, how he would regard the civil war, or which side he would take, if any, in the struggle. They had known young Roland Bayard from his infancy, and known him to be pure, true, brave, and heroic as his namesake but they could not judge, without him, which side he would take in the conflict. Nor could they reconcile it with their knowledge of these men, that they should run up the black flag, and wage a war after a manner little better, if any better, than piracy. But of one course they were clear. 
namely, that they must keep this baleful report as to Captain Grandier and Mate Bayard from the hearing of little Rosemary Hedge. The child must not be made miserable by a mere rumor which might have no foundation in fact. Mrs. Force was even more affected than her husband by the doubt that hung over the fate of the kitty. She answered her housekeeper's letter, disclaiming all belief in the story that Captain Grandier and Mate Bayard had turned the kitty and her crew into pirates. And for the rest, told her that they, the Force family, should not return home for some months to come, even if then. Later on there came a letter from Miss Susanna Grandier respecting her niece. Miss Grandier wrote in a rather stilted style, after the manner of her old-fashioned romances. She wrote, All through the beautiful summer, all through the glorious autumn, all through the desolate winter of the past twelve months, we have been anticipating the exquisite happiness of beholding you again in the blooming spring, when nature rises from the grave and arrays herself in fresh and radiant apparel. But alas, evil days have fallen upon us. War stalks abroad over our beloved country, spreading ruin, misery, and desolation. Brother rises up against brother, and father against son. Friends and neighbors whose hearts and minds were once united in the closest and holiest bonds of friendship and affection are now severed and estranged in mutual hatred and malignity. In this spread of affliction and calamity, a rumor reaches us to the effect that the condition of your husband's constitution will detain you in foreign countries for a considerable time to come. If this report be truthful, and you should contemplate a further sojourn in the Eastern Hemisphere, I must implore you still to retain my beloved niece under your protection until you can procure some responsible escort to convey her across the ocean to the home of her childhood. I should not venture to take the liberty of preferring this request, did I not accord the most perfect credence to your protestations of attachment to our beloved child, and of enjoyment in her society, and of the invaluable benefit she herself derives from foreign travel. This, and much more to the same purpose and in the same style, wrote Miss Grandier. Mrs. Force showed this letter to Rosemary, and then had a talk with her, and found that the child was quite willing to do whatever her friends should think best. Then Mrs. Force answered the letter, condoling with Miss Grandier on the state of the country, but also expressing the pleasure she and all her family would feel in keeping little Rosemary with them, as long as the child might be permitted to stay. Still later on, letters were received from Lee. His ship was at Charleston, forming one of the blockading fleet. Late in the summer of that year the forces went again to the hot baths of Baden-Baden, for the benefit of the husband and father's health, which was giving the whole family much concern. CHAPTER Four: ROSEMARY IS STARTLED Strange to say, that while Abel Force seemed in danger of becoming a confirmed invalid, the condition of his delicate brother-in-law improved every day. He no longer required the arm of his valet to lean on, or even the help of a cane to walk with. One day his sister said to him, "'Francis, I do believe that you have been more of a hypochondriac than of a real invalid after all.' "'Elf,' he answered, "'I am inclined to suspect that you are right. Certainly most of my ailments, real or imaginary, have vanished under the influence of change, motion, and society.' As the earl continued to improve in health and strength, his sister watched him with a new interest. On another day she said to him, "'Francis, why don't you marry?' Lord Enderby started, and then he laughed. "'What has put that into your head?' he inquired. "'My anxious interest in your future, now that you have a future, brother. Would you, who are my heir presumptive, wish me to marry?' "'Indeed I would. You would be so much better and happier. Think of it, Francis.' "'My dearest, I am both too old and too young to fall in love,' laughed the earl. "'What rubbish! Too old and too young! What do you mean by such absurdity?' "'I have passed my first youth of sentiment, and I have not yet reached my second childhood of senility. Therefore I am both too old and too young to fall in love. Nonsense! That is not true. And even if it were, you are neither too young nor too old to marry. It is not necessary that you should fall in love. You might meet some lady— however, whom you could love, and esteem, and marry. Where should I be likely to find such a lady? My dear, I have never gone into society at all. Since my return from India, I have led a secluded life on account of my health. On account of your hypochondria, you mean. Now, Francis, you must change all that. In the beginning of the next London season, you must open your house on Westburn Terrace and entertain company. Will you do the honors, Elfrida? Of course I will, replied the lady. 
and you can bring out your two daughters and present them at court. Yes, I might do that. Very well. Had the earl felt disposed to look about him for a wife, he might have found a suitable one in Baden-Baden. There were many of the English nobility and gentry staying there for the benefit of the baths. Many very attractive young ladies of rank were in the matrimonial market. But, to tell the truth, the invalid earl, either from real ill health or from hypochondria, was very shy of strangers, and better liked to stroll or ride or drive with the children, as he called his nieces and their young friend, than to linger in the parlors of the hotel or the pavilions of the place. In their rambles Odalite seldom joined them. She preferred to stay with her suffering father and share the labors of her mother in the sick-room. The earl and the three younger girls usually set out together. Wynnette and Elva walking on before, the earl, with little Rosemary's hand clasped in his own, followed behind. Ever since that day, now more than a year ago, when the reunited members of the Force family met at Baden-Baden and paired off, Mr. and Mrs. Force on one sofa, Odalite and Lee on another, and Wynnette and Elva on the window-seat, leaving the earl, as it were, out in the cold, and quite forgotten, and little Rosemary also temporarily forgotten, had drawn a hassock to the side of his easy-chair and sat down, and laid her little curly black head on his knee, in silent sympathy. Ever since that day the earl and the child had been fast friends. In her tender little heart she pitied him for his weakness and illness, just as she might have pitied any poor man in any rank of life, and she had fallen into a habit of silent sympathy with him, and of drawing her hassock to the side of his chair when they were all indoors, and of taking his hand when they were out walking. Even now, when the invalid had recovered health, strength, and spirits, these habits of the child once formed were not easily to be broken. She no longer pitied him, because she saw that he was no longer an object of pity. But she drew her hassock to his side indoors, and took his hand and walked with him outside. She seemed to think that he belonged to her, or she to him, or they to each other. One day they were sauntering slowly through the grounds of the conversation house, when Aunt and Elva were flitting on before them. Rosemary's hand was, not on the earl's arm, but in his hand. He was so very much taller than the girl that he led her like a child. There had been a pause in their talk, when the earl gently closed his fingers over hers, and said, "'My little one, I love you very much.' "'Oh, I hope you do, and it is so kind of you,' warmly answered the child, returning the pressure of his hand, and acting toward him as she would have acted toward her uncle. "'Then you do care for me a little?' he said." "'Oh, yes, indeed. I care for you a great deal. I am very fond of you,' said Rosemary, warmly, squeezing his fingers. "'How old are you, Rosemary?' he gravely inquired. "'I shall soon be seventeen. "'Indeed!' he exclaimed, turning and looking down on her. "'Yes, indeed,' she answered positively. "'Well, you are such a quaint little old lady that I am not surprised, after all. "'You might have been fifteen, or you might have been twenty. "'But seventeen! That is a sweet age!' the age at which the Princess Royal of England was married. Indeed, exclaimed Rosemary in her turn. Yes, indeed, he replied with a smile. And then there was silence between the two for a few minutes. The earl was meditating. The child was uneasy and wondering why she was so. Little friend, he said at last, you and I seem very good friends. Oh, we are, and it is so very good of you to be friends with me, she answered warmly, squeezing his fingers in her small hand. "'And we are really fond of each other. "'Oh, very, very fond of one another. "'And it is so kind of you. "'But why should you say it is kind of me, little sweet herb? "'Oh, why, because you are so old and so grand, "'and I am so little every way,' she said, "'with another squeeze of her fingers. "'The earl winced, but whether at her words or her action, who could say? "'Am I so old, so very old, then, Rosemary?' he gravely inquired. "'Oh, no, no, I did not mean that. "'Of course, I didn't mean that you are as old as Mr. Force, who is forty-five. "'But I meant, I meant, I meant you are so very much grown up "'to be so kind as to walk and talk with a girl like me as much as you do. "'Well, my dear, do you not like to have me walk and talk with you?' "'Oh, yes, indeed, indeed I do. "'Oh, you know I do,' she answered fervently. "'Again the earl was silent for a few moments, and then— Drawing her small hand into the bend of his arm, he asked, "'Rosemary, would you like that you and I should walk and talk together every day for the rest of our lives?' She turned and looked up into his face, as if she wished to read his meaning. He smiled into her upraised eyes. 
"'Are you in earnest?' she inquired. "'Perfectly, Rosemary. Do you think I would jest with you on such a subject?' "'No, but I thought you knew me so well that you would know without asking, that I would love dearly to walk and talk with you every day, all our lives long, if we could. But how could we? Some of these days I shall go back to Maryland, and then we shall part and never meet again. Oh, I hate to think that we shall never meet again. You do seem so near to me, so very near to me, as if you were my own, my very own. Oh, sir, I beg your pardon. That was very presumptuous. I ought to have said— I ought to have said— She stopped and reddened. What, my child? You have said nothing wrong or untrue. What do you think you ought to have said? The earl inquired, in a caressing tone. I think I should have said that I feel so near to you, that I feel as if I were your own, your very own. It was too, too arrogant in me to say that I feel as if you belonged to me. I should have said, as if I belonged to you, she explained. And then she laughed a little, as in ridicule of her own little ridiculous self. His hand tightened on hers as he replied, "'Suppose we compromise the question, and say that we belong to each other.' "'Yes, that is it, and you are so good.' "'And you really wish that we two should walk and talk together every day for the rest of our lives?' "'Oh, yes, if it could be so.' "'Rosemary,' he said very gravely, as he still held and pressed her hand, "'there is but one way in which it could be so.' He paused, and she looked up. How long he paused before he could venture to startle the child by his next words. "'By marriage. Rosemary, dear, will you marry me?' She turned pale, but did not withdraw her astonished eyes from his face. "'What do you say, little friend?' inquired the suitor. "'Oh, oh, oh,' was what she said. "'Does that mean yes or no, Rosemary?' She did not answer. "'You do not like me well enough to marry me, then, Rosemary?' "'Oh, yes, I do. Indeed, indeed I do. I would marry you in a minute. But, 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 but what? I am engaged.'" End of chapter 4《Chapters 5 and 6 of When Shadows Die by E. D. E. N. Southworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter 5 The Earl is Startled. He held her off to get a better view of her face. Then he stared at her. You engaged? he cried. She nodded two or three times in reply. Such a mite as you. Why, how long have you been engaged, pray? I don't quite know, ever since I can remember. Oh, a family arrangement between your parents and your betrothed husbands, I suppose. Oh, no, not at all, only between him and me. At that early age, do babies betroth themselves in America? I don't quite know, but we did, and we were not both babies. He was a schoolboy, but I think I was a baby at first. At first, very likely. Well, when are you to be married? I don't quite know, but not until Roland gets his rights and comes into his estates. Ah, there is litigation. But who is this happy man Roland? He is a mate on a merchant ship at present, but when he gets his rights, I am sure he will be a nobleman of high rank and maybe a prince of royal race. Oh, said the earl, with a curious smile. Then, growing suddenly very grave, he inquired, My dear child, do your parents know anything about your relations with this adventurer? He is not an adventurer, said Rosemary. But when he, a skipper's mate, represents himself to be a man of rank, kept out of his rights. But he don't represent himself to be any other than what he seems. Oh, I beg your pardon, my dear. I thought you said he did. No, oh no. I said that I feel sure that when he gets his rights, he will be a nobleman or prince. Ah, but why should you think so, my dear? Oh, no one could look at Roland Bayard and not know him to be one of princely rank, exclaimed Rosemary, with such solemn fervor that the earl turned and gazed at her. And is this the only reason you have for thinking the young man of gentle blood? No, not only his looks, but his voice, speech, tone, manner, gesture, all proclaim him of noble blood. As Rosemary spoke, she suddenly turned and looked intently at the earl, and then she added, Yes, it is true, it is not my imagination. I have thought it often, though I never spoke of it before. Of what, my dear? Of Roland Bayard's likeness to you. To me, my dear? Yes, to you, but for the difference in age and in health, he is as much like you as one man can be to another. Indeed? Yes, indeed. 
an imaginary or an accidental likeness, my child. But, Rosemary, to return to yourself, do your parents or guardians know anything of your relations with this questionable stranger? He is not a questionable stranger. He was brought up among us at home. Did I not tell you he used to ride me on his shoulder when he was a boy and I was a baby? Then, if he is not a stranger, you must know all about him, and whether he is of high or low degree. We do know all about him, but nothing at all about his family. He was saved from a ship that was wrecked on our coast, and he was the only one saved, and there was not a mark on him or his clothing to identify him. Mr. Force undertook to provide for him, and placed him with Miss Sibylla Margareta Bayard, who was herself descended from a great English duke, though no one would ever think so to look at her. Mr. Force also sent Roland to school, and afterward to college, and he would have sent him to the Naval Academy at Annapolis, only he had already used all his influence to get Leonidas entered there, and he could not ask the same favor for Roland. So Roland, being bent upon going to sea, entered the merchant service. Ah, I see. But, my child, it seems to me that you have not yet answered the question that I have twice put to you. Do your parents or guardians know of the engagement between you and this young man? I have only one parent, my mother. My father was lost at sea, before I was born, and left no property and no will, because his ship went down, with everything on board. My mother has some property, and so has Aunt Suki, and they take care of me, said Rosemary. And that was all she said at the time. The Earl looked at her curiously. Was the child purposely evading his question? No, the grave little face was too true for that thought. Does your mother or your aunt know of your relations with young, young... Roland Bayard? Yes. Why, I think everyone in our neighborhood must know all about it, because we all know all about our neighbors, and some say that they know more of us than we do ourselves, and that we know more of them than they do of themselves. I think that quite likely. But do your friends approve of your engagement? Not now, but they will when Roland comes into his rights. You poor child, murmured the earl, in a low tone. Then speaking in a clearer voice, he asked, "'Rosemary, would you marry this young man without the approbation of your friends?' "'No, never,' she answered solemnly. "'That is right. Now then, if your friends were to counsel you to accept another suitor whom they approved, would you do so?' "'No, never,' replied the child, more emphatically than before. "'Then what would you do?' "'I would be an old maid like Aunt Suki. I never would marry Roland Bayard against the will of my mother and my aunt, nor would I ever marry any one else even to please them.' I would be a maiden lady, like Miss Susanna Grandier. Little true heart, well, little friend, I will not try, through your guardians, to marry you against your will. Neither, I think, will I marry any one else. And in any case, we shall always be friends, shall we not, little sweet herb? Always, and it is so good of you to say so, exclaimed Rosemary, giving his hand another fond squeeze. They sauntered on in silence until they overtook Wynnette and Elva, who had sat down on a garden seat to wait for them. "'It is time to go home to luncheon,' said Wynnette, "'and I am starved.' They turned their steps toward their hotel, and reached it in time to join Mr. and Mrs. Force and Odalite at luncheon at their usual hour. That afternoon, while Mr. Force was taking his daily nap, and the young girls were resting in their chambers, the Earl found himself alone with his sister in their private parlor. "'Elfrida,' he said, "'I want you to tell me something about this little protégé of yours.' "'Rosemary Hedge?' "'Yes.' Well, she is the daughter of the late Captain Hedge, of the Merchant Service, and of his wife, Dorothy Grandier, the daughter of the late Gideon Grandier, of St. Mary's. Her family is one of the oldest and best in the state, and her friends have entrusted her to us for the benefit of travel. That is all there is about Rosemary Hedge. No, not quite all. The little one tells me that she is engaged to be married. Who, Rosemary? Yes. Engaged to be married? Yes. This is news to me. I never even suspected such a thing. Nor do I know how she has ever had an opportunity of being wooed, far less one, exclaimed the lady in surprise. And yet the child honestly thinks that you know all about it, replied the earl. I know nothing, and I am really distressed at the news you tell me. Have I been so absorbed in the care of my sick husband as to have neglected the interests of the orphan child? What adventurer has picked her up in the name of heaven? Tell me, Francis, if you know." "'Do you know anything of a young fellow called Roland Bayard?' significantly inquired the earl, fixing his eyes intently on the face of his sister. 
That face paled under his wistful gaze, but the lady recovered herself in a few moments and replied, "'Yes, he is a young man who in infancy was cast upon our shores from a wrecked ship. He was cared for by Mr. Force, who placed him in charge of a respectable woman and afterward sent him to school and to college. "'Does anyone know anything about his parentage?' He was the sole survivor of the wreck. There was not a mark on his clothing or on his person to give a clue to his parentage. But as Mr. Force has practically adopted him, he will not need to investigate his own antecedents. He is in the merchant service now. Yes, I have heard so much from Rosemary. But now as to his character. He is above reproach. A not unworthy namesake of two heroes, Roland and Bayard. But why do you inquire into the history of this young man? "'because it is to him that Rosemary is engaged or thinks herself engaged.' "'Oh,' laughed the lady, "'that is an old story.' "'It cannot be an old story, since the child is but seventeen. "'It is relatively an old story. "'When he was a schoolboy, he was much favored by his friends the Grandiers, "'who lived at Oldfield near Forest Rest, where his foster-mother, Miss Bayard, lived, "'and where Roland was reared. "'Rosemary was a baby. "'He used to pet her very much and tell her that she was his sweetheart and his little wife.' and all such childish nonsense as that, and I think they kept it up until Rosemary was sent to boarding school with our girls. Since that time, some five years ago now, I think there has been no more of it. I thought it was all forgotten long ago. But it is not, you see. The child thinks that she is engaged to him. I wonder if she is attached to him, said the lady thoughtfully. I do not quite know. Perhaps, as she believes herself to be engaged, she may also only believe that she is attached to him. It is a subject upon which one cannot very closely cross-examine a young girl. No, you could not, but I must, replied the lady. Without mentioning my name, if you please, Elfrida, said the earl, who also religiously refrained from telling his sister of his proposal to Rosemary, lest Mrs. Force should try to influence the girl in his favor, and he did not wish the latter to be worried or coerced in any way. Certainly without mentioning your name. "'I shall know how to manage, with tact and discretion,' replied the lady. "'One word more, Elfrida. "'Would you approve of a marriage between this Roland Bayard and Rosemary Hedge?' inquired the earl. "'Yes, I should. "'That is all. "'But I have not the disposal of the child's hand, "'so my own approval goes for nothing.' "'It is enough,' said the earl, "'and he opened the window looking from the parlor to the balcony, "'and went out there to walk and smoke. "'Chapter Six: A Strange Meeting the middle of October found the forces with their party again at Rome, settled in their old quarters. News of the war came by every mail, bringing accounts of battles fought and lost or won. They were of those few who in the dreadful struggle could not take any side. They only longed for peace and reconciliation. They passed the winter in Rome, but in the early spring Mr. and Mrs. Force and their daughters began to long for their native country, even more than for their particular home. There seemed no present prospect of an end to the fratricidal war. The holocausts of youth, manhood, and heroism offered up monthly to the devil of discord did not seem to appease his rapacity. Every mail brought news of new battles and of thousands and tens of thousands slain on either side, the storm of war raging more and more furiously as the months went on. Elfrida, said Mr. Force one day, I cannot stand it any longer. We must go home, my dear, and be with our country in her need not to burn and slay and rob on one side or the other, but to nurse the wounded and feed the hungry, and clothe the naked, and give all our time, money, and energy to this needful work. You and your daughters, and even your crippled husband, can do this much to abate the pain of the age. He had said words to the same effect before, but never with so much of sorrowful earnestness as now. Well, we will go, Abel. Yes, it is indeed our duty to do so. Besides, our Odalite is wasting away with hope deferred. We have not heard from Lee for so many months. He may be dead on some crowded battlefield, or ill and delirious in some hospital, or in some prison. We might find out his fate by going home. And then there is poor little Rosemary fretting out her heart about young Bayard, who has never been heard of since he sailed with Captain Grandier, now nearly three years ago. We might find out something satisfactory about him. We all need to go home." There is no one but Wynnette who is not breaking down under this anxiety and uncertainty. Wynnette thanks heaven every day that Sam Grandier chooses to stay home and mind his crops. As for Elva, she makes everyone's trouble her own, and suffers for and with all. Yes, we all need to go home. And our home and our country needs us. 
added Mr. Force. So it was decided that they should return home as soon as passages for their whole party could be secured. Mrs. Force dreaded to tell her brother of the impending separation. The Earl had grown so much better in health, spirits, and happiness while traveling in their company, that it would seem like relegating him to gloom, solitude, and despondency, to send him back alone to his old life at Enderby Castle. She took the time immediately after breakfast the next morning to break the news to him. "'Going? Going back to America?' he exclaimed in astonishment. "'Yes, it is our bounden duty. The war is not the temporary disturbance that you thought it was to be. It is growing more terrible every month. It may last yet for years. We must go to our home and do the best we can for everybody,' replied the lady. And then she went over the whole subject, as it had been discussed between herself and her husband. "'Yes, my dear, it is your duty to go home,' admitted the earl. "'Still, my dear brother, we are very sorry to leave you. "'I hope, however, that you will not go back to Enderby Castle "'to your old solitary life there. "'It is very bad for you. "'I hope you will go up to London and open your house on Westbourne Terrace "'and call your friends together and entertain them, "'even though I shall not be there with my daughters to help you, "'as I had once hoped to be. "'I shall not go to London, Elfrida. "'I have no friends there, and I hate society.' "'No, I shall go to the United States with you,' said the Earl. "'You don't mean it!' exclaimed Mrs. Force, between surprise, pleasure, and incredulity. "'Yes, I do most certainly mean it. I have never seen America. And though the state of civil war may not be the most pleasant aspect under which to view a new country, yet it is certainly the most interesting. And so, Elfrida, if you have no objection, I shall go with you to America.' "'You know that I am delighted at the thought of having you,' said the lady." "'Has Force written to engage passage?' inquired the Earl. "'He intends to write this morning to inquire about the first ship on which he can get berths for all our large party to New York. "'Then ask him to see about two additional berths for me and my valet.' "'Thus it was arranged that the whole family party, including the Earl, should go to America together. "'In due time the answer from the agent of the Cunard line arrived. "'They could all be accommodated on the Asia, which would sail on the 23rd of March.' This is the ninth. We have just two weeks to get ready in. We had best start for Liverpool as soon as possible, and make our final preparations for the voyage there, said Mr. Force, after he had read the letter to his assembled family. And, oh, Papa, let somebody go to Enderby Castle to fetch Joshua, exclaimed Wynnette. Why, my dear girl, the old dog may be dead, said the Earl. Oh, no, he is not dead. I write to Mrs. Kelsey every week to ask about dear Joshua, and he is very well. "'And he is not an old dog. "'He is only nine years old. "'I remember him ever since he was a puppy. "'Well, it has been over two years since he saw you, "'and he has forgotten you by this time. "'Oh, no, he hasn't. "'We were away from home three years and three months, "'and he never forgot us. "'You ought to have seen how he met us. "'Well, my dear, when we get to Liverpool, "'I will telegraph to one of my grooms "'to bring the dog to us. "'Dear uncle, how I love you.' A week from this time the whole party were settled at the Adelphi Hotel, in Liverpool, to await the day of their sailing for New York. Mr. Force kept his room. The Earl of Enderby spent hours in his own apartment, with his family solicitor and his land steward, both of whom had been summoned by telegraph to meet him at Liverpool. The ladies of the family spent their days in final shopping, providing themselves, among other conveniences, with thick linsey woolsey suits for sea wear, and with heavy astrakhan wool shawls for wraps. In due time, the groom from Enderby arrived with Wynnette's dog in his charge. Space does not permit to describe the interview between the two. It is enough to hint that Joshua, in dog language, bitterly reproached his mistress for breaking faith with him, and deserting him for so long a time, and then magnanimously forgave her, while Wynnette was all apologies for the past and protestations for the future. On Saturday, the 23rd of March, the whole party embarked on board the ocean steamer Asia, then at anchor in the Mercy, and bowed to sail for New York at twelve noon of that day. There was the usual crowd on deck with the usual partings, friends departing, and friends who had come to send them off, some grave, some cheerful, some merry, some despondent. At length this was all interrupted by the shout of the first mate from the poop, All ashore! And the last hurried good-byes were spoken, and the last embraces given and the friends of the voyagers hastened over the gangplank to the steam tender which had brought them to the ship. Then the farewell gun was fired, and the Asia stood out to sea, 
her passengers standing in lines to gaze on the receding land. Mr. Force and his party were walking up and down the deck of the steamer, when they saw coming from the opposite direction a figure so remarkable that it would at once have attracted attention anywhere. It was the tall, stout figure of an old man, with a fresh red face, clear blue eyes, a white mustache, and a commanding presence. He wore the uniform of an American skipper, with its flat, gold-rimmed cap. As he approached, Mr. Force stared, and then started and held out his hand, exclaiming, "'Captain Grandier, you here! Why, where did you drop from, and where is Roland Bayard?' The gruff old sailor stopped to lift his cap to the ladies, and to shake hands all around, and to be introduced to the Earl of Enderby, and to shake hands with him, before he replied to Mr. Force's first question. "'My ship, the Kitty, was taken by that infernal pirate, the Argent. I was set ashore, alone on the English coast. I had some correspondents at Liverpool who supplied me with funds to return home. That is all. But where is Roland Bayard?' "'With the pirates.' End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven and Eight of When Shadows Die by E. D. E. N. Southworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter Seven An Old Salt. Among the pirates, Captain Grandier. Roland Bayard among the pirates? exclaimed Mr. Force, while Mrs. Force closed her lips with a sudden motion and grew a shade paler. Rosemary began to tremble, and the other girls to look anxious. "'Come aft. Let us find seats somewhere, where we will not be spied or overhauled, and I will tell you all about it,' said the old skipper, moving down toward the stern, where the deck was almost deserted by the other passengers, who were all gathered forward, leaning over the bulwarks, and taking a last look at the receding shores of England. They found seats on the wooden benches, and sat down. The old skipper took off his cap, and wiped his large red face and close-cropped gray head, and then said, "'I didn't expect to see you here. I should as soon have thought of seeing Oldfield Farmhouse standing up before me, right in my path, as a group of old neighbors, with my little niece in the midst of them. Heavens and earth, how a civil war shakes people up! I dare say, now, you all left on account of the war.' "'No,' said Mr. Force, "'we left before the war to visit my brother-in-law here.' and to give our young people some advantage in foreign travel. My own ill health has detained us abroad for more than two years. We return now, on account of the war. Good Lord! Abel Force, you are not thinking of going into the army, in your crippled condition. No, not exactly, but we can all be useful in the hospitals, even my wife and daughters, in caring for the sick and wounded soldiers, and for the widows and orphans of the dead, so far as our strength and means will go. "'Ah, that is something else. "'When did you hear from the folks at home? "'I have not heard from them for years. "'I got a letter a week ago from your niece, Miss Grandier. "'Your nephew, William Elk, is in Richmond, on General Lee's staff. "'Your nephew, Thomas Grandier, is in New Orleans, with General Butler. "'And your grandnephew, Edward Grandier, is with Farragut in Mobile Bay. "'Sam has elected to stay at home, follow the plow, and take care of the woman.' "'Sam has the only solid head in the family, except my own. "'Look at that now. "'Brothers and kinsmen shooting each other down, "'running each other through the body, blowing each other up, "'as if they were at war with a foreign enemy. "'Oh, Lord, Lord!' groaned the old skipper, "'flinging down his cap with force upon the deck "'and furiously wiping his perspiring face. "'It is grievous enough, but it is human nature, "'and we cannot change it. The strangest part of it all is that the men composing the rank and file of each army have no personal ill will toward their antagonists. Each fights from a sense of duty. Each invoke the blessing of God upon their arms. There was a time, Grandier, in our lives, when peace reigned so long that we all began to believe that war belonged only to history, and barbaric history at that, and had passed away forever, as one of the last relics of barbarism. It was the Mexican War that woke us up from our dream of the millennium, and since that there has been in one part of the civilized world or another almost incessant and most ruinous war. So when we call ourselves a Christian, civilized, and enlightened people, we tell a lot of bragging lies, out with it, Papa, in plain English, put in Wynnette, who had held her tongue until it ached. Who is this girl? inquired the old skipper. My second daughter, Wynnette. Surely I introduced her to you, said the squire. So you did, but there are so many of them, you know. 
I used to dandle this one on my knee when she was a baby, but she has grown out of my knowledge, said the old skipper. Then, turning to Wynnette, he grasped her hand and said, Right you are, my dear. We are a lot of braggarts and ignoramuses. So far from being Christians, civilized and enlightened, we do not even know what these terms imply. We are heathens, barbarians, and we live in the twilight. Right you are, my dear, as to your opinions, but wrong in your way of putting them. Interrupting your father. Discipline should be maintained, my dear. Remember that, said the old skipper, not unkindly. Before the astonished Wynnette could reply, Rosemary put in her piteous little plaint and said, "'Oh, Uncle Gideon, dear Uncle Gideon, tell us about—about—' about, she meant to say Roland Bayard, but she reddened and substituted the pirates. "'Of course, that is what I brought you here for. You have heard about the pirate Silver and his ship, the Argent?' "'I have seen notices of depredations made by the Argent. It is a privateer in the Confederate service, is it not?' inquired Mr. Force." privateer yes and worse it is a pirate in the confederate service no no further than running the blockade to carry in merchandise to sell at ruinous prices would go the argent is a privateer a blockade runner a slaver and a pirate just as a few years ago we thought war had passed away from the face of the earth forever so we thought that piracy had been swept from the sea but we were mistaken in both cases our civil war the blockading of our southern ports the emancipation and consequent stampede of the negroes have brought into action a fleet of sea robbers who call themselves privateers and pretend to be in the service of this or that faction but who are really pirates and slavers they are armed to the teeth and are manned by the most reckless desperadoes gathered from all nations mostly jailbirds convicts criminals they take our merchant ships they steal slaves from the west indies run the blockade and sell them in our southern ports or, with equal impartiality, when opportunity is given, they decoy slaves from the southern plantations by the promise of a free passage to the north, and they carry them to the West Indies, where they sell them to the planters. The most notorious of these brigands of the sea is the Argent. I have never yet heard of any of them being taken. The old sailor, having talked himself out of breath, stopped, wiped his forehead, and flung his rolled handkerchief with force upon the deck. "'But Uncle Gideon, dear Uncle Gideon, tell us about—about about the pirates,' pleaded Rosemary, pale with sorrow. "'My pet, I have told you about the pirates,' grunted the skipper. "'But—but—about—about about the loss of the kitty,' pleaded Rosemary. The old skipper snatched up his cap from the deck and flung it down again with violence. Then he said, "'Yes, devil fly away with them. They took the kitty. I can't talk about it, girl. The devil takes possession of me every time I think of it. They took the kitty.' That is all that is in it. Maybe some time or other, when the devil forsakes me, I will tell you all about it, but not now. Not now. Tell us something at least of Roland Bayard, said Wynnette. I did tell you. He is among the pirates. But in what capacity? Is he a prisoner or a volunteer? persisted the girl. Oh, oh, Wynnette! Roland Bayard could never be a volunteer among the pirates. He would suffer himself to be killed first. Yes, to be tortured to death first. "'Yes, yes, to be slowly tortured to death first. "'Oh, Roland, Roland!' wailed Rosemary, "'too deeply distressed for her childhood's friend "'to conceal her emotions. "'Captain Grandier, touched by the trouble on the quaint little face, "'pulled himself together, patted her head, and said, "'Don't cry, little girl. "'Roland is not a volunteer in the pirate crew. "'I never believed that for one minute, "'though Silver, the head devil, told me so. "'No, my child, he is a prisoner among the pirates. "'I am sure of that.' Oh, that is some comfort. I would rather they should keep him a prisoner, or even kill him, than make him wicked. Indeed I would, Uncle Gideon. But how comes he to be among the pirates, and you here? He a captive, and you free. Tell me that, Uncle Gideon, said the little creature, with a shade of reproach in her troubled tones. And while Rosemary waited in suspense for the answer, there was another who listened anxiously to catch its every word. This was Elfrida Force. Chapter 8 the loss of the kitty. I will tell you, my girl, though I hate to talk of it. About a month ago I sailed from Havana, bound to London, with a cargo of rum, tobacco, and sweetmeats. The weather was fine, and we had a good voyage until we came within four or five days' sail of port. A sail had been following us all day long. We did not know she was following us, nor could we make out by our best glass what she was. 
She was the only sail in sight. As night closed in, she gained on us. That was certain. But still we could not make her out. She did not come near enough for that, for the kitty is a pretty fast clipper herself. As night darkened, we lost sight of the strange sail without any misgivings. But in the gray of the morning, she was alongside of us. "'Hold on, the devil is getting into me again,' exclaimed the old sea-dog, snatching Mr. Force's hat from his head, and flinging it with vehemence upon the deck. "'The fortunes of war, Captain, the fortunes of war. Be patient,' said Abel Force. "'The fortunes of murder, robbery, arson, piracy. There was no fight.' THE WILL OF PROVIDENCE, THEN. THE WILL OF THE DEVIL. YOU SHAN'T LAY THEIR MURDERS AND ROBBERIES AND ARSONS AND PIRACIES UPON PROVIDENCE. THAT WOULD BE BLASPHEMY. THERE WAS NO STRUGGLE. WHAT COULD OUR UNARMED LITTLE BALTIMORE CLIPPER DO? THOUGH EVERY ONE WAS A HERO. AGAINST A PIRATE SHIP OF TWENTY-FOUR GUNS, MANNED BY THE DESPERATE OFFSCOURINGS OF THE GALLEYS AND THE CONVICT PRISONS. ALL ARMED TO THE TEETH, BRISTLING WITH PISTOLS, DAGGERS, AND CUTLASSES. NOTHING AT ALL. They boarded us, walked into us, and threw us, and made prisoners of our men, took possession of our ship, then put the men into two open boats, and sent them adrift to sink or swim, and carried off me and young Roland captives to their own deck, and finally sent off an officer and a detail of their devilish pirates to work the kitty, and Satan only knows where they carried her and her valuable cargo of rum and tobacco. We parted company then and there. I never saw young Roland after that. I believe he did make some resistance, and was wounded. I saw him bleeding and carried below, and I never saw him again. Here the captain made an involuntary dash at the earl's cap, but his hand was intercepted by Mr. Force. "'He'll scalp us next,' said Wynnette. "'Umph, umph, umph,' grunted the captain. "'Oh, Uncle Gideon, oh, Uncle Gideon,' moaned Rosemary, while Mrs. Force gripped her own hands firmly in silent trouble." "'Don't cry, honey. I believe he is safe enough, and will turn up all right. I called them murderers, and no doubt at all. Some of that criminal crew were murderers, and worse than murderers, if such could be. But they did no murder in my sight. They might, had they chosen. They might have massacred all hands aboard the kitty, but they didn't. They put the men in open boats and set them afloat to take their chance. And then, for some reason well known to himself, but quite unknown to me, Captain Silver took young Bayard and myself on board the Argent. I said I never saw Roland after he was taken down below, nor did I, but I did not fail to inquire for him. The head devil told me that the young man was all right, that his wound was only skin deep, that his men never killed or wounded men, whom they could so easily overpower and capture without bloodshed, and especially in the case of a fine young seaman who might become useful to them. "'Oh, Uncle Gideon! Then they did only take Roland on board to make a pirate of him.' "'Of course they did, my dear, for when I asked to see Roland, Silver told me, with a satanic laugh, that the young man was in retreat, preparatory to entering his novitiate in the holy orders of bold buccaneers, roaring sea-rovers, and that no outsider should have access to him, for fear they might shake his good resolutions, and even win him back to the selfish world.' "'What a devil!' exclaimed Wynnette. Every day I inquired about Roland, and each day I received answers which would have made me believe that the boy was gradually being persuaded to become a pirate, if I had not known that Roland Bayard could never become so perverted. No, never, 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 firmly declared Rosemary. But while Bayard was kept a close prisoner, I had the run of the deck, continued the captain. One day I asked Silver where he was bound. He told me, with infernal insolence, that he should touch on the coast of England, put me on shore, and then go about his own business. Two days after, we came to anchor on a lonely part of the coast of Cornwall. It was a dark night, and they put me in a boat and took me ashore and left me there, with just two sovereigns in my pocket-book. They had robbed me of thousands, but they left me that much to take me to London. I don't know why, I am sure, that it should sometimes occur to a scoundrel to stop short of the extreme wickedness he might perpetrate. But, at all events, Silver did stop short of the crime of leaving me penniless to perish at night on a desolate sea-coast. I passed the night in a solitary fisherman's cottage. In the morning there was not a sight of the Argent to be seen. She had sailed again. I walked to the nearest railway station, distant twelve miles, and there I took the parliamentary to London, for I had to economize my small funds. I went down to the West India docks, where I was as well known as the church clock, and saw some of my correspondents— told my story, got all the money I wanted, and took the express to Liverpool, 
reached there yesterday, engaged a berth, and here I am. "'Was your ship and cargo insured?' inquired Mr. Force. "'From keel to masthead,' answered the skipper. "'But that was against fire and water and accidents. "'Now, I don't know whether being taken by a pirate "'would be considered as coming under the clause of accidents or not. "'But anyway, you know the insurance companies "'are bound to make a fuss before they pay a cent. "'They always do. "'Your losses, then, I fear, may be heavy.' "'Yes, but not ruinous, even if the insurance companies do not pay, "'because I still have the bluebird that George sails.' "'Where is Captain George now?' inquired Mr. Force. "'In the China Seas somewhere, if he has not been taken by a privateer. "'But where is your nephew, Leonidas?' inquired Captain Grandier. "'We do not know. We have not heard from Lee for many months. "'When we last heard, it was through a letter from him, "'dated on board the United States ship Eagle, "'then about to sail under sealed orders.' "'We are all, therefore, naturally very anxious,' replied Mr. Force. "'Aye, aye, these are anxious times for us all. "'But at any rate, the man of war is safe from the pirates, "'who prey only on unarmed merchantmen. "'Hope the sealed orders were to go after the privateers, that is, pirates.' "'The conversation was interrupted by the sound of the dinner gong, "'and passengers began to troop down from the deck to the dining saloon. "'Seasickness had not yet come on to take away their appetites.' The earl, who had been a silent though interested listener to the story of the old skipper, and who had his own private opinion of young Roland Bayard's position in the pirate ship, arose and drew the arm of Rosemary within his own to take her down to dinner. Old Captain Grandier offered his to Mrs. Force. Mr. Force took his eldest daughter, and Wynnette made a manly bow and took Elva under her protection. And so they went down to their first dinner on the Asia, and their last for several days. For a more stormy passage than that of the Asia, which sailed on that March morning, was never weathered by ocean steamer. After dinner, the old skipper went on deck to smoke his pipe alone. The forces went down into the ladies' cabin to look at their staterooms, arrange their effects, and get comfortably settled in their quarters before seasickness should overtake and disable them. Our party occupied three staterooms in a row, on the right-hand side of the cabin, as you entered it from the forward gangway. Nearest the gangway was the stateroom of Mr. and Mrs. Force, next to that the one of Odalite and Elva, and last of the three was that of Rosemary and Wynnette. All the three rooms were exactly alike, and each had a door opening into the cabin, and opposite the door a little window looking out on the sea and sky. On the left hand, as you entered, there was a wide berth at the bottom, and a narrow one at the top. On the right hand was the wide sofa. Under the lower berth and under the sofa were deep drawers to hold the sea wardrobe and other effects of the passengers. In the angle between the side of the window and the end of the sofa was a stationary washstand, with all needful accessories. In the angle between the other end of the sofa and the door leading into the cabin was a stationary lamp, locked up in a heavy plate-glass box and carefully lighted and locked up every night, and unlocked and extinguished every morning by the stateroom steward. The little door of this glass box or closet was in the general cabin, so that the lamp could be attended without intrusion into the stateroom. For the rest, all the fittings of the staterooms were cabinet-finished. The floor was covered with a thick crimson Brussels carpet, the berths and the windows curtained by crimson satin damask, and the sofa covered with crimson moreen. Under the stationary lamp was a corner bracket of black walnut, with three shelves to hold books or anything else that could be contained on the limited space. Below the forces' quarters was a long row of staterooms, exactly like their own, and on the opposite side of the cabin, a corresponding row, all occupied by ladies and families who were total strangers to the forces, and perhaps in many cases to each other also. The ladies' cabin was fitted up very much as most well-appointed steamer cabins are, with handsome carpet, sofas, easy chairs, mirrors, water coolers, and so forth. Down the middle stood a long oval table, at which you could sit and read, or write, or sew, or talk with companions. This table was lighted at night by three large chandeliers hanging from the ceiling. The forces were well pleased with their quarters, and as for the girls, they were always running in and out of each other's rooms, comparing and admiring. Only Mrs. Force was anxious about the comfort of her invalid brother. His stateroom was in the gentleman's cabin. She would hear when they should meet at tea, whether he were well accommodated— they had scarcely completed their arrangements when the gong sounded to call the passengers to tea. They went up to the saloon, where they were joined by the earl and the old skipper. Their party of eight just filled one table, 
which they thenceforth kept for themselves. The old skipper was installed at the head of the table, and the squire at the foot. Mrs. Force and the earl sat on the right and left of the skipper. This arrangement of the four adults was maintained for the whole of the voyage, but the four young people sat as they pleased. This table had two waiters, and they were well attended. In answer to Mrs. Force's questions, the earl gave her a good account of his stateroom, adding it was near that of the captain. After this the whole party went up on deck for a promenade. The setting sun was striking a broad path of glorious light across from the western horizon to the bows of the ship. "'It seems the course of our voyage,' said Odalite. "'We are sailing toward the setting sun, and just now in its path of flame.' There were many more people on the forward deck, but after the sun had dropped below the horizon, the wind gradually freshened, and it grew very cold. Then Mr. Force proposed that they should leave the deck. They all went down to the saloon, and gathered around one of the vacant tables, where the captain entertained them with sea-yarns, and even sang a sea-song. There were many other groups of passengers gathered at the other tables, but they were still strangers to our party, when the old skipper began to sing his song with its roaring refrain of, Oh, what a row, what a rumpus and a rioting, they all endure, you may be sure, who go to sea. Conversation stopped at all tables, and all the people turned to listen. Presently several joined in the chorus, and made the saloon ring again with melody. At the close of the song the singer was loudly applauded, but he excused himself from repeating the experiment. At ten o'clock supper was served for those who wished it, but as our party were not among that number, they left the saloon and retired to their berths, where they were all soon rocked to sleep by the motion of the ship, and so ended their first day out. End of chapter 8《Chapters Nine and Ten of When Shadows Die by E. D. E. N. Southworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter Nine The Sea King's Daughter. The next day the passengers all arose early to go on deck, but most of them had to lie down again before they had finished dressing, and to remain in their staterooms, where they were attended by the stewardess. The ship was approaching Queenstown. All our party, however, came upon deck. Some of them were sick enough, but they all thought that the fine air of the upper deck was better for them than the close air of the staterooms, or even of the cabin. The weather-beaten and weather-proof old skipper and his grandniece, little Rosemary Hedge, were the only ones who remained perfectly well, with a keen appetite for breakfast, and a wholesome enjoyment of the sharp March morning. "'How is it with you, my girl?' inquired the skipper when they all met in the bows, and exchanged their morning greetings, and compared notes about endured or threatened sickness. "'How is it with you? You look as fresh and as bright as a brand-new sixpence, and you are as steady on your pins as if you had been to sea all your life.' "'She has been to sea longer than that,' put in Wynnette, the incorrigible. "'She is only seventeen years old, but she has been to sea about two hundred years, to my certain knowledge, and how many thousand years before that I don't know.' And if she has not exactly followed the sea, in her own person, she has in that of her ancestry, on both sides of the house. Her father was a sailor, her two grandfathers were sailors, and her four great-grandfathers. And from them she has inherited her good sea legs. No doubt of it, no doubt of it, slowly and approvingly replied the old skipper, as he gazed admiringly on his little niece. Ah, if she had only been a boy, what a sailor I could have made of her. They were drawing very near to Queenstown now, and in less than half an hour the Asia dropped anchor in the cove of Cork. As soon as the ship was still, the seasick got well, and went down to breakfast. After that they returned to the deck, to look out upon the coast of Ireland. As the Asia was to wait there for some hours to get the last mail, many of the passengers went on shore. Our party remained on the steamer. In the afternoon the excursionists returned. The ship made preparations for sailing. Our party sitting on the deck, and all feeling perfectly well now that the ship was still, overheard some gruesome words from one of the men. That bank of clouds in the west means mischief and dirty weather ahead. Do you hear that, Jack Tar? inquired the old skipper of his little niece. Yes, Uncle Gideon, she answered, lifting her large blue eyes to his face. And do you know what dirty weather ahead means? Yes, Uncle Gideon. Well, what does it mean? Why, it means furious storms to come. Did you ever hear the phrase before? No, Uncle Gideon. Then how do you know what it means? 
I don't know, but the meaning seems plain enough. Oh, then I must tell you how you know, by instinct, by inheritance, just as the blind kitten knows a dog the instant it scents his approach. I should think you would not only know what dirty weather means, but also the signs of its coming. Even I, who am neither a sailor nor the son of a sailor, can tell the signs of its presence, said Wynnette. They are a ship deluged with rain and dilapidated by wind, slopped all over by waves and holding several hundred human wretches, all deadly sick at their stomachs. If that is not dirty weather, I don't know the meaning of words. And that is just such weather, Miss Wynnette, as we shall be likely to have, more or less, for the next ten days or longer. And the officers and men know it and are preparing for it. But never you mind, little Jack Tar. We shall not go down. And as for the rest, you can stand the storm. You are a natural-born sailor. As the old skipper spoke, the signal gun was fired, and the Asia steamed out of the cove. The sun had now set behind a heavy bank of clouds. The wind had risen with more force than on the preceding evening, and blew so freshly that all the passengers, with the exception of a few weather-beaten men and well-seasoned voyagers, went below. All our party, with the exception of the old skipper and his little niece Rosemary, not only went down, but turned in to be looked after by the hard-worked stewardess, or not unfrequently by one of the stewards. "'You don't want to go below to the stifling cabins, do you now, little Jack Tar?' inquired Captain Grandier of his small companion. "'No, Uncle Gideon, I do not, indeed. I should much rather stay up here with you as long as I may,' replied the child. "'Thought so, and so you may. Ah, if heaven had given me such a boy!' "'But, Uncle Gideon, although I can walk the deck when the ship is rolling, without falling or turning sick, I know I should not make a good sailor-boy, said Rosemary. "'Why not, pray? I say you would make a good sailor-boy. Why, every one of the passengers has gone down and turned in as sick as dogs, and here you are as well as I am. "'But I couldn't be a sailor-boy, because—' "'Because what? Because I should be afraid to climb the ropes and things so high. I should be afraid of falling on the deck and killing myself.' or falling into the sea and getting drowned, pleaded Rosemary. Now don't go to tell me that you have inherited your sailor forefathers, sea heads, and sea legs without their stout hearts. Don't go to tell me that, said the skipper, taking his pipe from his mouth and staring down at his little companion. The quaint little creature looked so ashamed of herself that the old man took pity on her and said, Ah, well, you are nothing but a bit of a girl, after all and the very tiniest mite of a girl for seventeen years of age that I ever saw in my life. Well, you shan't be a sailor and work on board ship. You shall be a dainty little lady in your own house, with servants to attend you when you go up or down. Come now, tell your old uncle a secret. Isn't my lord sweet on you? And the old sailor took his pipe from his mouth and poked the stem of it into her side. Sweet on me, echoed Rosemary, in perplexity. In love with you, then. Every girl knows what that means as soon as she knows her right hand from her left, or sooner. Tell me the truth now. Isn't the earl in love with you? Oh, no, exclaimed Rosemary, in all sincerity. For although she knew that Lord Enderby had proposed to marry her, it never occurred to her to think of his being in love with her, or anybody else, because she considered him so much too old for her, old enough to be her father, as in truth he was. "'Well, then, I don't know the weather signs in that latitude, that's all. "'His eyes are never off you, child. "'If he has not told you he loves you, he will do so soon. "'You must then refer him to me. "'I am the head of the family, and in the lack of your father must stand in his shoes. "'You are very young to marry, Rosemary, only just seventeen. "'And I should accept his lordship's offer only with the understanding that he should wait for you a year. "'But then I should accept him, my girl.' for it is not often that an English earl offers marriage to the daughter of a merchant captain, even though she is a little beauty, and does come of a good family. And Enderby is a good sort. That is better than being an earl. He is a good sort. Here the old man put his pipe in his mouth and smoked on in silence for some minutes, during which Rosemary sat by his side in dumb distress. At last the skipper took out his pipe, blew off a cloud of smoke that went floating over the sea, and then he said, so you understand, my dear, that I, the head of your family, entirely approve the suit of Lord Enderby. Rosemary was ready to cry. But, Uncle Gideon, I don't want to marry the Earl. I like him so very much. I love him, I love him dearly. He is the best man I ever saw in my life, and I do love him dearly, dearly, but I couldn't marry him. 
and I wouldn't marry him for the whole wide world, exclaimed Rosemary, with her little face and frame all quivering with her earnestness. Well, upon my word, muttered the old skipper, laying down his pipe for good and all, and staring at his little niece, but to no purpose, for they were sitting in deep shadow now, and he could not see her face. You love the earl dearly, and would not marry him for the world? That is crazy talk. What do you mean by it? Why, one does not want to marry people because one loves people. I love you and Uncle Force and Cousin Lee and Sam and Ned and ever so many more. But I would not marry any of you for all the world, even if I could. And I love Lord Enderby more than I do all the others. But I would not marry him. I would die first. Then I know what is the matter. The secret is out. You love someone else even better than you do the Earl. Is not that so? I am the head of the family, Rosemary, and I have a right to know. Uncle, whispered the little creature, in a tremulous voice, as she clasped her tiny hands over her heart, speaking frankly under the friendly cover of the darkness. Uncle, I am not free to marry the Earl, even if I wish to do so, which indeed I do not. I am engaged to Roland Bayard. Good Lord, bless my soul alive, exclaimed the old man. Since when, if you please? Oh, I don't know, Uncle Gideon, but I have been engaged to Roland for years and years and years. Bless my soul and body. It is a sacred bond, and I wouldn't break it even if I could. Ah, the love that grew from childhood. Was that it, Rosemary? Yes, dear Uncle Gideon. Well, he's a good sort, too, is Bayard. As the old skipper spoke, one of the stewards came on deck with a message from Mrs. Force. Would Captain Grandier be so good as to send Miss Hedge down to the ladies' cabin, as it was too late and too cold for her to remain on deck? I will take you down myself, said the old man. And he escorted the girl to the door of her stateroom, and bade her good night. Rosemary was soon asleep in the upper berth of the room she shared with Wynnette. But the old skipper spent hours on deck before he turned in. CHAPTER X. THE PRIVATEER ARGENT What a night! The wind rose to a hurricane. It had a thousand voices. It hummed, sang, whistled, and hurrahed as it danced in the rigging. It moaned, wailed, howled, and shrieked as it knocked the ship about. The steamer rocked, tossed, and tumbled in the stormy sea, now rising high upon a heaving wave, now dropping into the gulch of the sea. Passengers could not sleep that night. It was as much as they could do to hold on and keep their places in bed. Those on the upper berths were in danger of serious falls. Rosemary, who shared Wynnette's stateroom and slept in the upper berth, let herself down by a series of difficult but successful gymnastics and lay upon the sofa, trembling. Presently she crept to the door, opened it a little way, and peeped into the cabin. The place was quiet, the doors of the other staterooms all closed, and no one present but the local night watchman, sitting composedly by the single light. She closed the door, crept back to the sofa, and lay down again. Presently, she said, "'Wynnette, how can you sleep through this?' "'Sleep!' cried Wynnette. "'Who's asleep? Not I. Who could sleep through such a demoniac opera as this? Rosemary, the Germans swear ten thousand devils, in their own language, and I think the whole ten thousand German devils must be holding an open-air concert, after the manner of their musical countrymen.' and that right around our ship. Only they are all roaring drunk, and every one singing and playing and piping and blowing out of tune. I never heard such a hullabaloo in my life. Oh, Wynnette, do you think there is any danger? No, I don't. If there was, the passengers would all be out of their berths and dressed, to be ready for the lifeboats. And there would be a great running and racing, and pulling and hauling, and cursing and swearing on deck. And the officers would all be blaming the men's eyes and livers and lights, too encourage them, you know, and making a hullabaloo to be heard above the hurricane, and much more horrible than the hurricane, too. No, there can be no danger yet. But would all that profanity go on in a beautiful ocean steamer? inquired Rosemary. A good deal of it would on occasion. You may bet your best boots on that. Oh, I wish it was morning, sighed Rosemary. So do I, but if wishes were horses, beggars would ride, you know. Morning came at length, however, and as the sun arose the wind went down, but not entirely, for it still blew and often started up in gusts. None of our party appeared at the breakfast table, or even afterward on deck, except the old skipper and Rosemary. The day passed wearily. At intervals Captain Grandier visited the Earl in his stateroom, and Rosemary her friends in their own. 
Both visitors found the sick ones cross and sulky, and so indisposed to be friendly and social, that they were speedily left to themselves. People are no more responsible for their behavior when they are seasick than if they were lunatics. At night all hands turned in early, and the wind rose and blew a hurricane all night. And as the day had passed, so the week passed. Sunday came. As the weather continued to be tempestuous, the passengers remained seasick. No one came up on deck except the old skipper and his grandniece. The old man was dressed in his Sunday clothes and carried a Bible, a prayer book, and a hymn book in his hand. He drew his little companion away to a comparatively sheltered part of the deck, and they sat down to read the service for the day, the old man reading for the minister's part from the book, and the young girl making the responses from memory. Then he read the lessons for the day, and finally they sang a hymn. At dinner-time they went to the saloon, but found it almost deserted. The ensuing week proved quite as tempestuous as the one just passed. They were, in fact, suffering from a series of equinoctial storms. When the ship reached the banks of Newfoundland, they experienced some variety of weather in the shape of blinding snow and stinging sleet, added to howling winds and leaping waves. None but the officers and crew of the steamer, and our old skipper ventured on deck. Even Rosemary stayed below. It is hard enough to keep one's feet on a rolling deck when it is dry, or on an icy surface when it is still, but to stand or walk on the sleety boards of a rocking ship is well-nigh impossible to any one but a seasoned old salt. So Rosemary, as well as her companions, kept to the cabin or the saloon. To as many as were able to appear on the common ground of the last-mentioned place, the old man made himself very useful and agreeable in helping them to pass away the long days, and especially the long evenings. He told stories, sang songs, and recited poetry, miles of poetry, which he said he had committed to memory in the lone watches of his half-century of sea life. All this time the steamer was not flying, not even running, but as it were, only tumbling against the wind and weather toward the port of New York. But it happened on one fine morning, when the winds and the waves fell, and the sun shone brightly and warmly, and seasick passengers got well and came out on deck like hibernating animals in the spring, they spied a pilot boat, number 15, coming toward them. There was a general jubilee. They were not yet in sight of land, but they could not be far from port, for the pilot boat was coming. Half an hour later the pilot boat was alongside, and the pilot on deck, with a batch of the latest New York and Washington papers, and with news, such news. A crowd gathered around him at once. His papers were taken right and left, and all the men turned eagerly to the first columns of the first page of his own particular sheet to read, latest dispatches from the seat of war. Before every man's face fluttered the open newspapers like spread sails while they devoured the news. But the pilot's oral news, which was so very fresh that it had not had time to get into the morning papers, was more interesting to our immediate party than all the rest. Mr. Force, who was deep in news from the peninsula, caught the words, Lieutenant Commander Force, and he looked up. The pilot was hastily and excitingly recounting some adventure to a group of men gathered around him to listen. Among these was the old skipper Grandier, who seemed eagerly interested. The pilot spoke hurriedly, for he had presently to take command of the ship to carry her into port. Mr. Force dropped his paper and joined the group. What is it? he inquired of Gideon Grandier. But the old man was too intent upon the words of the pilot to hear any others. "'What is it?' inquired Mr. Force again. Then the pilot stopped to answer him. "'The blockade-runner Argent, Captain Silver, sir, taken off of the coast of South Carolina by the United States ship Eagle, Captain Warfield, Silver, and his first officer, and all his crew who were not killed in the fight, taken prisoners and put in irons. The Eagle put a part of its own crew on board the Argent under command of Lieutenant Force, who brought the prize safely into port this morning with Silver and his first officer in irons.' "'Thank heaven!' exclaimed Captain Grandier. "'But do you call her a blockade-runner only? "'She's an infernal pirate. "'She took my kitty. "'And Silver shall hang for it.' "'And the Argent is now in New York Harbor?' inquired Mr. Force. "'No, sir. "'She was telegraphed from the Navy Department "'to sail at once for Washington. "'And she sailed an hour ago.' End of chapter 10《ハッピーバーゲンハッピーバーゲンハッピーバーゲンハッピーバーゲンハッピーバーゲンハッピーバーゲンハッピーバーゲンハッピーバーゲンハッピーバーゲンハッピーバーゲンハッピーバーゲンハッピーバーゲンハッピーバーゲンハッ
Oh, Mrs. Force, where is Roland? He was on the pirate ship, you know. Oh, was he wounded in the sea fight? Was he taken prisoner? Was he killed? Oh, was he killed? breathed little Rosemary Hedge, pulling at the lady's dress and lifting her light blue eyes beseechingly to the lady's face. Let us hope that he has been rescued, my dear, and brought home in honor, since you know he was himself a captive among the pirates, replied Elfrida Force, whose face looked quite as pale and anxious as the distressed little face turned up to hers. But, but, does not the pilot know? Can he not tell us? Will not someone ask him? I think he has told all he knows, my dear. Remember, the Argent was only in port a few hours this morning, after the morning papers were out, and before the afternoon papers were out, the pilot put to sea at once. He could not have got but an outline of the facts, and perhaps not even a true outline. Oh, Uncle Gideon, pleaded Rosemary, leaving the side of Mrs. Force and joining the old skipper. Oh, Uncle Gideon, won't you please ask the pilot if he heard of any prisoner among the pirate crew, rescued from them by the Eagle, or if he heard anything at all of Roland Bayard? Yes, yes, child, I will ask him, promptly replied Captain Grandier, pushing to the front of the group and hailing the pilot, who was elbowing his way through the questioners, who would have detained him longer. Ahoy, shipmate, not so fast. Answer one question, and then you may go. Well, what is it? demanded the pilot. Heard you of any honest prisoner rescued from the pirates? No. Heard you of any man of Roland Bayard? No, never heard that name before. There were but two names talked of, Nickel Silver, the captain of the blockade runner, and Craven Cloud, his first officer, said the pilot, now breaking away and hurrying aft. And they'll both be hung as high as Haman, or my name is not Grandier, and I never commanded the good ship Kitty, and she was never taken from me with all her cargo by the piratical ship Argent, devil sink her. Blockade runner, is it? No doubt in the world she was a blockade runner. But she was so much worse than that. She was a pirate of the worst order, attacking and taking unarmed merchantmen, and committing Lord knows what atrocities besides. Ah, I'm glad. I'm glad I didn't stop longer in England. I'm glad I came over, so as to be able to give evidence that will hang the pirate captain and his mate. I shall take the first train to Washington after landing. I must be on hand to give my evidence as soon as possible or those devils would be claiming to be treated as prisoners of war because they were taken while trying to run the blockade. Prisoners of war, indeed, after taking my peaceable kitty with her cargo and sending her crew adrift. We'll see when I get to Washington. My evidence will hang them as high as Haman. Don't you think a fifteen-foot gallows and a five-foot fall would be quite as effectual, Captain Grandier? inquired Wynnette. What do you know about it? demanded the skipper. Nothing at all. That is the very reason why I was turning the question over in my mind, and asking for instructions. Oh, Mr. Force, oh, Mr. Force, what has become of Roland? pleaded Rosemary, in a low, wailing voice, as she took the squire's hand. I wish I could satisfy you, my dear, but I cannot. We may learn something from the evening papers when we land in New York. If we do not, we shall certainly find out when we reach Washington, where we shall meet Lee. Oh, how soon shall we go to Washington? By the first train after we land. Of course, you know, we did expect to spend a few days in New York, but this news has altered all our plans, and we shall go on immediately to Washington. Tomorrow? Early tomorrow? No, tonight, so that we may be in the city tomorrow morning. Then, said the quaint little being, I must bear the suspense as well as I can, and trust in the Lord. And in the meantime, remember, my dear, as your uncle said, we have every reason to hope and expect that Roland is safe on board the Argent. Being already a prisoner on board the blockade runner, he could not have been in the sea fight, and therefore he could have been neither killed nor wounded. If taken prisoner by the eagle, among the rest, he must soon have told the story of his capture, and he must have been recognized by his friend Lee, and released and brought home in honor. Yes, said Rosemary, in her grave, demure way, I think that is very probable and we are going to Washington to find both our lads, Lee and Roland. Oh, Lord grant it, fervently exclaimed Rosemary, clasping her tiny hands and lifting her light blue eyes. Mr. Force turned to look at his daughter Odalite. What a change had come over the pale, grave face of the girl. Her cheeks and her lips were glowing with fire. Her dark eyes were sparkling with light. What do you think of all this, my dear? he inquired. Oh, father, I feel so happy, so happy. Lee has distinguished himself. 
Lee is the hero of the day. Thank heaven! Oh, thank heaven! We shall see Lee in a few hours from this. See Lee safe, well, and honored. Thank heaven! Oh, thank heaven! Mr. Force looked at his wife. Her face was very pale and troubled. My dear Elfrida, he said, you let your sympathy for little Rosemary Hedge and her lover affect you without cause. I think there is no doubt the young man is now quite safe on board the Argent, on her way to the Washington Navy Yard. We shall land at New York about sunset. We shall leave our effects at the Custom House and take the night express for the south. We shall reach Washington before the Argent gets there, but we shall wait for her, and as soon as she arrives we shall find both the boys safe, Leonidas and Roland, safe. "'You are very, very good,' she replied in a low tone. "'There is the gong for dinner. "'I have an appetite for the first time in ten days,' he said gaily, "'as he drew his wife's arm within his own to take her down. "'At all the tables in the dining saloon nothing was discussed but the war news. "'General Grant was slowly fighting his way on to Richmond, "'opposed by an army that was daily wasting away under toil, fever, and privation.' but who made up for want of numbers with indomitable courage, endurance, and self-devotion. After dinner, the passengers all went up on deck to watch for the first glimpse of land. Many had glasses, through which they looked long and wistfully to the westward, and then passed their instruments on from hand to hand among the less fortunate passengers, who had none of their own. Often they mistook a cloud lying low on the horizon for a line of coast. Presently, someone staring through the glass cried out, "'Land!' "'Nothing but a low cloud,' cried another man, staring through another glass. "'The Highlands!' cried the first speaker. And in a very few minutes, the Highlands was the verdict of all on the outlook. The progress of the ship was now very rapid. She soon passed the Narrows and stopped. The quarantine officers came on board. No ship ever came into the harbor with crew and passengers in a healthier condition, Mr. Force's chronic rheumatism being the only case of indisposition on board so the Asia was allowed to go on her way, and reached her pier a little after sunset. Mr. Force at once landed with his party, taking only such luggage as they had used during the voyage, and which could be carried in the hands of the servants. This was duly examined and passed by the custom-house officers, the bulk of their luggage to be afterward brought on by the groom of Lord Enderby, who was left in charge. There was a train for Washington at nine o'clock. It was now seven. They had time to go to a hotel and take tea. They had scarcely left the Custom House officers before they were assailed by a swarm of newsboys crying their papers. Evening, this, that, or the other. Latest from the Perninsular. Capture of the blockade runner Argent by United States ship Eagle, etc., etc. Hi, boy, let us have a paper, called Mr. Force, as they were swarming past him to a large group of men, who were also just off the steamer famishing for news and calling for vendors. Two or three turned back. Mr. Force and the Earl bought papers from all of them. At this moment the negro valet who had been sent for carriages came up with two. The papers were distributed to the members of the party, and they entered the carriages, the four girls in the front carriage and the four elders in the hind one, and read as they drove along. But in fact they learned nothing more from the papers than they had learned from the pilot except that there were more details of the fight which ended in the capture of the privateer by the man-of-war. The word privateer always put the old skipper into a rage. Privateer, he exclaimed, they might as well call an assassin a mere sneak thief. She is a pirate of the most devilish description. She took my unarmed kitty. She seized her cargo. She sent her crew adrift in open boats in mid-ocean. And I'll hang all hands for it. I swear it. "'I don't think you could hang a whole ship's crew,' laughed Lord Enderby. "'Well, may I be blowed from a cannon's mouth myself if I don't hang the head devil and his mate. "'That's what I'm going to Washington for, to make my charge.' "'In good time they reached their hotel, took their tea, "'and sat down to rest and read the papers at their leisure before starting on their night journey. "'Here a little surprise met the whole party. "'When Mr. Force tendered a ten-dollar gold piece in payment of his bill at the counter of the office,' The coin was rung suspiciously on the board, then examined critically, and finally dropped into the till. And he was handed a ten-dollar greenback and a two-dollar greenback in exchange, with the information that he would find it all right, as gold was that day at one hundred and twenty per cent premium. This information so astonished the simple squire that he did not recover himself until he had reached the railway station at Jersey City. 
The party arrived in full time to purchase their tickets and take their seats. Chapter 12. On to Washington. Everybody is happy but me. Oh, Uncle Gideon, I have looked all over, up and down, and everywhere in the papers, and I cannot see one word about Roland. Oh, Roland, Roland, moaned little Rosemary, as she sat on the seat beside the old skipper in the crowded car. My poor little girl, such a small item as the rescue of a single prisoner from the pirate ship would scarcely be noticed in a first hurried account of the capture by the eagle. Have patience, my dear little one. In a few hours we shall hear from Lee himself whether Roland is with him. And remember, my girl, that you are going to meet your dear mother and aunt and all your near relations, whom you have not seen for so many years, and who are counting the hours until you come to them. Think of your own kindred, my child. Oh, I do, I do, and I do love my dear mother and dear aunt, dearly, dearly, but they are both safe and well, and so I am not anxious about them. But, oh, Roland, Roland, she wailed in a little low tone. Mrs. Force, who sat beside her husband immediately in front of Rosemary and her uncle, heard the little low moan, and turning to the squire, said, "'Abel, dear, will you change seats with little Rosemary, and let the child sit with me for a while?' "'Certainly,' replied Mr. Force, and the change was effected at once. Mrs. Force put one arm around Rosemary's waist, and drew her in a close embrace, as she whispered, "'You must pray, and hope, and trust, my dear.' We have no reason to fear that any evil has happened to Roland. Oh, ma'am, I am praying all the time, in my heart, for Roland, sighed the girl. Well, darling, when you pray, you must trust. Oh, I do try to, I do try to, but this dreadful uncertainty. Oh, just look how happy Odalite and the other girls are. But Odalite, every time she turns her head around, her face flashes. She is so delighted. Oh, I hope I am not envious, but I do wish I felt as sure of seeing Roland safe and well, as you all are of seeing Leonidas great and happy. Mrs. Force smiled, pensively, at the exaggerated words of the poor little girl, but she did not attempt to criticize them. It was now nearly ten o'clock, and in spite of excitement and anxiety, the travelers yielded to a sense of fatigue and drowsiness, ceased to talk, and began to doze. There was no sleeping car on that train, or if there was— the party had not engaged berths, so they sat in uneasy attitudes and dropped off one by one into slumber that was only disturbed by the stopping of the train at the stations, and quickly resumed when the train was again in motion. They woke up thoroughly when they reached Philadelphia, where several more cars were attached to the train, and a number of troops got on to go to Washington, en route to reinforce General Grant's army. Many of these soldiers could not find seats, though the train was a long one and they had to stand in a line down the middle of the cars. This made the air stifling, oppressive, and stupefying. Our party dropped off into a deep, unwholesome sleep, which lasted until the train reached Baltimore, when they one and all awoke with a sense of sickness and semi-suffocation. But here people got in, and people got out, doors were opened at each end, and a draw of purifying air went through and revived the sufferers. Here still more cars were attached to the train, and more troops got on, and the crowd was even closer than before. Again, our victims succumbed to the stupefying effects of the confined air, and slept heavily and unhealthily until they reached Washington. Day had dawned when the train crawled into the depot. The closely packed multitude got out, and filled all the space that was under cover. Mr. Force piloted his party through the crowd and out into the open air. "'I doubt if we can get a carriage,' said the squire, looking around." and his doubts were speedily and unpleasantly set at rest. He could not. If there had been any on the spot, they had been seized by the first travelers, who had jumped off the train to secure a ride. There is nothing for it but to walk to our hotel. Luckily, it is not very far off, said Mr. Force. It was a fine morning, and dawn was reddening in the east as they left the depot and walked on toward Pennsylvania Avenue. They walked somewhat stiffly at first, from having been cramped up so long in the railway train, but the fresh air was reviving, and so they all felt more invigorated at every yard by their progress. They reached the hotel with fine appetites for breakfast. Mr. Force found, on inquiring at the office, that the house was full. There was not a room or a bed to spare, but the house could give them breakfast. So they waited in the public parlor until the breakfast hour came, when they went down into the saloon and took their morning meal. After breakfast, Mr. Force went into the reading room to inquire about the Argent, and to look at the morning papers. 
The rest of his party waited for him at the foot of the stairs leading to the parlor. At last he came and said, "'The Argent has not yet reached the Navy Yard, nor has she been heard from since leaving New York yesterday morning, but she is expected today.' "'And what are we to do next?' inquired Mrs. Force. "'You and the girls will remain here, in the ladies' parlor, and read the newspapers, or amuse yourselves in any way you please. Captain Grandier is going to see the Secretary of the Navy, to report the capture of his clipper, the Kitty, by the Argent. Enderby will go out with me in search of lodgings. We must find some place to sleep in this overcrowded city, and we must get out of it as soon as we can.' as soon, that is, as the Argent business is settled, and Leonidas gets his leave. We shall all return here in time for dinner. With these words, Mr. Force opened the door of the parlor, and saw the ladies of his party in. It was yet so early that the parlor was quite empty. "'I think you might venture to recline on some of these sofas, and go to sleep,' said the squire, as he nodded good morning and left the room, accompanied by the earl and the skipper. When they went down, left the hotel, and stood upon the sidewalk, Mr. Force looked up and down the streets in search of that line of hacks which usually stands drawn up before every large hotel, but it was not to be seen. Inquiry of the porters developed a startling fact. Nearly all the horses in Washington had a plague called epizootic. There were but few hacks in the public service now, and they were always on the go. There were but few streetcars running, because there were but few horses to draw them, and they were always overcrowded. "'Shall we walk, Enderby, or shall we stand on the reeking platform of one of these passing cars?' Mr. Force inquired. "'Oh, walk, by all means, as long as we have a leg to stand on, in preference to adding three hundred pounds more to the burden of those poor beasts,' promptly replied the Earl. "'Fortunately, all the best hotels are on or near the avenue,' observed the squire, as they turned westward. "'Now, doesn't it seem as if war were quite enough of evil without a plague among the horses, Enderby?' inquired Abel Force. "'You may thank heaven that the plague is not among the humans,' replied the earl. "'Here is the Metropolitan. We will try here,' said the squire. And they went in, but were not successful. The house was full. So hotel after hotel was tried, but all in vain. All were full. The two gentlemen walked on toward the west end of the avenue. There at length they found, in one of the largest and best hotels in the city, a suit of three rooms, two double-bedded chambers, and one single one. These were secured at once for their party of eight, and at a rather high price, too. Then they went back to the place where they had left the ladies of the party. The old skipper had already returned. Mr. Force reported progress, and described the best apartments he had been able to find. "'You can see there is scarcely space left for us in Washington. We must get back to Old Maryland as fast as we can,' added the squire. Captain Grandier followed suit and told of his adventures. He had not been able to see the secretary at all. Ante-room full of lovers, who were seeking offices or other favors. He had to wait his turn, and before his turn came, a fellow opened an inner door, and announced that the secretary could see no one else that day, and added that he had gone home. Then he, the skipper, had gone down to the navy yard to inquire about the Argent, and discovered that the prize had been signaled from Fortress Monroe, and was expected to be at Washington Navy Yard the next day. "'And you shall see as fine a sight as you could wish "'when I am confronted with that devil to-morrow. "'He expects by what we read "'to be treated as a prisoner of war "'and to be put on his parole and set free. "'He certainly doesn't expect to find me on hand "'to stop his little game "'and send him to prison to be tried for his life, "'and in the end hung for piracy,' "'added the old skipper. "'Oh, if we could only hear from Roland,' "'sighed little Rosemary. "'Be patient, dear. "'We shall hear to-morrow,' "'whispered Mrs. Force.' "'Oh, to-morrow, and to-morrow, and to-morrow,' sighed Rosemary. "'We will go down and get some luncheon, and then go on to our new quarters. "'And to-night we shall sleep in motionless beds for the first time in two weeks, thank heaven!' exclaimed Wynnette. "'They went down to the dining saloon and lunched. "'Then Mr. Force settled the bill, and the whole party went out. "'The squire caught a hack on the fly, put his five ladies into it, and gave the driver the address. "'The hack drove off.' The three gentlemen walked all the way to the hotel. When they reached it and were gathered in the parlor, some little discussion took place as to the division of three rooms among eight persons, and it was concluded that the four girls should have one of the double-bedded rooms, the earl and the captain should have the other, and Mr. and Mrs. Force should have the small one. The party retired very early that night, and in spite of anticipations of the morning, they all slept profoundly. 
End of chapter 12.